Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Greenlight Guru True Quality Virtual Summit, the three-day event designed to provide actionable takeaways you can implement in your own company to innovate faster, stay ahead of regulatory changes, and use quality as a strategic asset to grow your device business. This session is on why design validation is more than testing. How do we validate our validation? My name is Tom Riss, medical device guru here at Greenlight Guru, and I will be your moderator for today's event. We've got a really special presentation scheduled for you today. I know our presenter, Mike Drews, who many of you have seen on Greenlight Podcast before, is really looking forward to sharing his valuable insights and expertise on how we can validate our validation and defend our validation when FDA criticizes it. Before we dive too deep into today's presentation and introduce our presenter and his consultancy, Vascular Sciences, I'm going to touch on a few items real quick. First, this session is going to run about 45 minutes in total and will include a quick Q&A session at the end where Mike has been kind enough to answer your questions. So I encourage you to submit your questions through the presentation as they come up in the box on the right hand side and we will get to as many of them as time permits. Another reminder is this entire session will be recorded and accessible later on. Once this session wraps up, there's a 10 minute break before the next live session begins. If you are interested in learning how user experience, design and human factors engineering can accelerate product development, I encourage you to make sure you're registered for the following session and use your unique link to tune in. If you aren't already signed up, you can register for the next session and over 20 others at virtual-summit.greenlight.guru. I'd also like to share a few words about Greenlight Guru and why we put on this free virtual summit. If you've been on one of our training sessions before, you know we put these on because improving the quality of life is our mission here at Greenlight Guru, likely a similar mission as many of you at today's summit. Anything we can do as an organization that helps device makers bring safer, life-changing devices to market quicker and with less risk aligns with that mission. We're constantly looking for ways to fulfill that mission, whether it's through hosting free events and training sessions, through partnering with a world-class medical device consultants like today's presenter, Mike Drews, or through award-winning medical device QMS software. If you'd like to learn more about why medical device companies from across the globe are moving away from paper-based general purpose quality management systems and adopting our purpose-built medical device quality management software, I encourage you to head on over to www.greenlight.guru after today's presentation to schedule your free personalized one-on-one -on -one demo. In doing so, you'll You'll learn how the very best medical device companies are leveraging our purpose-built quality management software to gain ISO 1345 certification, market approval, breeze through audits, and push beyond just compliance to provide true quality medical devices. So if you're interested in learning how we can help your company, make sure you visit our website, greenlight.guru, after today's webinar to schedule that demo. Now, what we're here for, the bulk of today's presentation. Let me give a proper introduction to your presenter today and distinguished partner of ours here at Greenlight Guru, Mike Drews. Michael Drews, PhD, is, a president, is the president of Vascular Sciences, a consulting and training company offering a broad range of services to medical device, pharmaceutical, and biotechnology companies, including creative regulatory strategy and competitive regulatory intelligence, regulatory submission design, FDA presentation, preparation, and defense. Dr. Drews, received his BS, MS, and PhD degrees in biomedical engineering from Iowa State University in Ames, Iowa. He has worked for and consulted with leading medical device, pharmaceutical, and biotechnology companies ranging in size from startups to Fortune 100 companies. He also works on the regular basis for the FDA, Health Canada, the US and European Patent Offices, the Centers for Medicaid and Medi Medicare and Medicaid Services, or CMS, and other regulatory and government agencies around the world. Dr. Drews is an internationally recognized expert and featured keynote speaker on cutting edge medical technologies and regulatory affairs. He conducts seminars and short courses for medical device, pharmaceutical and biotechnology companies and regulatory and governmental agencies around the world. Finally, as an adjunct professor of medicine, biomedical engineering and biotechnology, Dr. Drews teaches graduate courses in regulatory affairs and clinical trials, 
clinical trial design, medical device regulatory affairs and product development, combination products, pathophysiology, medical technology and biotechnology at several universities and medical schools on premise and online. Quite the introduction. I know many of you are well aware of Mike Drews and all the work he's done on our webinars today. So without further ado, let me hand it over to you, to you, Mike. Well, thank you, Tom, for that very kind and somewhat long introduction. I want to thank you and all of my friends at Greenlight for the opportunity to be part of this conference today. And a special th thanks to everyone in the audience, both those that are listening live right now, as well as those that are going to be listening to the recording in the future, because without you, we would uh, just be wasting our time. So today I'm going to be talking about one of my many favorite topics, and that is uh, design validation, and specifically why design validation is more than just testing. How do we validate our validation, or as I like to call it, uh, not your grandmother's approach to validation. Tom did a terrific job of introducing me, so I'm not going to bore you with those details. The only thing that I want to point out for those that don't know me, <coughs> pardon me, is that um, I'm a contributing editor to several large medical device and regulatory publications, constantly putting out a lot of columns and articles and webinars and podcasts on a variety of topics. Um, and so here are links to some of them. There is a handout that goes along with this presentation, which you can download. Uh, although, let me tell you that uh, there are a lot of the slides that are in the handout I'm not going to be talking about in today's presentation. I always like to uh, under-promise and over-deliver. So there's a lot more information in the handout than we will be able to talk about today. Um, and speaking of uh, today's presentation, this is sort of an abbreviated version of a webinar that I did for Greenlight.Guru uh, just about a year ago, the same title. Uh, but I went into a lot of these topics in much more detail. So if you like today's presentation and you're interested in more detail, I would encourage you to listen to the longer version of this webinar, which is available for free on greenlight.guru's website at the URL shown on the screen. So just sort of a quick uh, 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 review or recap to kind of get started here about verification and val validation. I'm sure most everybody in our audience has heard that the difference between verification and validation, as many people as describe it, is design verification asks, did we design the right device? Whereas device validation asks, did we design, um, uh, I'm sorry, let me, let me start again. D design verification asks, did we design the device right? Whereas design validation asks, did we design the right device? There's a big difference between those two, but you know I've heard people say this a lot over the years, but as a PhD in biomedical engineering, I never really understood completely what exactly this means. Did we design the right device versus did we design the right device? And they are very different, and I think it's important to, to understand those differences. So let's dig into this in a little bit more detail. Obviously, the focus of today's discussion is on validation, but starting with the first V and V and V, and that is verification. Did we design the device right? What that essentially means in more words is we compare the output of each design process step with the input that led to that step in order to demonstrate that the results are consistent with our goals. Now, again, those are very easy words to put in the uh, regulation. Those are very easy words to put in a PowerPoint slide. But what the heck does that mean? I have no idea. Um, it, 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 I'll tell you what it doesn't mean, though. It does not mean, do we have the right goals? In other words, are we asking the right questions? Are we solving the right problems? And this brings us to the validation side of VNV, because that's all about, do we have the right goals? Are we asking the right questions? Are we solving the right problems? So let's talk about the validation piece, which in my opinion, is infinitely more important than the verification. Verification is important, don't get me wrong, but validation is infinitely more important for reasons that we're going to be discussing today. So at a high level, validation means did we design the right device, but what does that mean? Uh, in more words, we test our device against the requirements, so after our verification. But more importantly, um, 
most of you know in the design controls, it says that we're supposed to use devices that are our final, our production uh, grade devices uh, in our final VNV testing. This is a topic of a different discussion. I just wanted to mention it very quickly. But in a nutshell, that doesn't always happen. There are many situations where I will use a pre-designed freeze device to generate final VNV testing data. Most people think that, oh my gosh, you can't do that. Well, you can, and I've done it successfully many times. But in order to do that, as I said, this is a bit of a tangent. I'll get back to validation in a moment. In order to do to, to use um, uh, data on a pre-designed freeze device, you have to show both FDA as well as yourself, you have to prove to yourself that the changes in the design between the version that you test and the version that you um, that, that's the final product are not going to impact the results of that test. If you can if you can show that, then it's not at all a problem to use uh, uh, final to use data from a pre-designed freeze device uh, as part of your your final VMV testing. That's a little bit of a tangent, but I get that question a lot from. Uh, a lot of my customers, especially the startup and the small companies who can't necessarily wait until they have a final production quality version and they can't afford to do the testing over again. So there are other options there. But again, I want to get back to the subject matter at hand for today, and that is on the validation side. What does validation really mean? Is it simply ticking boxes on a form? Well, if you've listened to any of the uh, uh, podcasts that John Spear, the founder of Greenlight.gu and I do on a regular basis, you know that neither John nor I are fans of this tick box on a form mentality. And that includes validation. Valid validation is about a lot of things, but one thing it is absolutely not about is ticking boxes on a form. Um, and I'm going to share with you some examples of exactly what I mean by that uh, in the next several minutes. So are we required to validate our validation? In other words, are we solving the right problem? Are we asking the right question? Well, as ironic as it sounds, nowhere in the regulation anywhere does it say we are required to validate our validation. And the reason why I mention this is because I see lots of companies doing validations that to me, even though they tick the regulatory check boxes, to me those validations make absolutely no sense. And that helps to uh, explain why we continue to have so many medical devices come to the market that have problems. Because yes, we're validating them, but are we validating them in the proper way? In other words, are we solving the right problem? Are we asking the right question? And to me, as not just a regulatory consultant, but as a professional biomedical engineer, that's the most important part of this game. And that is, are we solving the right problems? Are we asking the right questions? You know. There's an adage, I, for those of you that are familiar with my background, I used to teach medical school back in the day. There's an adage that we, used to, that we use in medicine frequently, and that is the surgery went perfectly, but the patient died anyway. Well, the regulatory equivalent of that is that we followed the regulation perfectly. We did all that FDA or Health Canada or whoever asked us to do, including the validation, and yet the patient died anyway. Or the engineering uh, spin on that. We designed the medical device perfectly, and yet the patient died anyway. Unfortunately, these things happen, these problems happen more frequently than some people would like to admit. So as the first of several examples I wanted to share with you today, let's take a look at a uh, bare metal coronary stent. This is not a fancy schmancy uh, drug learning stent. This is just a, simply a bare metal coronary stent. So what you see on the screen right now is a patient's heart who has had a heart attack. And this area that I'm circling with my mouse is an area of tissue that has become necrotic or dead. Well, I hope everybody appreciates that we can put it, do an angioplasty, we can put in a stent, we can put in a drug eluting stent, we can put in a hundred drug eluting stents if we want to, but from the perspective of these cells in the heart that have died, have we accomplished anything? Absolutely not. Absolutely nothing. The best outcome, and this is the best we can hope for, the best outcome is to try to prevent this problem from getting worse. And in the absence of something better, Preventing the problem from getting worse, what we call palliative relief, is okay. The problem is we face this, medicine, this limitation in medicine for decades. It's about darn time that we get past it. I don't want to simply prevent this problem from getting worse. I want to erase the damage in the heart caused by the heart attack as if the patient never knew they had the heart attack to begin with. 
this is not the next evolutionary advance in medicine. This is not going from one generation of stent to another. What I'm describing here is a revolutionary advance, a change in the whole ethos of how we approach medical problems. And this is not going to be something that we accomplish with simple medical devices or even very simple combination products like Drevlin Extents. This is something that we're going to need uh, uh, true combination products, things like tissue engineering or regenerative medicine, as well as uh, biomedical nanotechnology, to areas of, of medical device technology that I've been working in for a very long time. Again, a little bit beyond the scope of today's discussion, but bringing it back to, to validation here, if we were to reverse engineer the, um, the regulatory or the quality strategy, what's the user need? The user need coming from a physician might be to restore blood flow through a coronary artery. Well, the problem with that is if you define your, new, your user need that way, all of your solutions that you come up with are going to be look like uh, bypass and angioplasty and stenting and atherectomy. In other words, they are all plumber's solutions. Because as you know, if you know something about the, the medical device development process, you're supposed to take those user needs and translate them into design inputs. So if your user need is to simply open up a clogged tube, I hope everybody uh, understands, especially the engineers in the audience, that you are limiting your solutions from the very beginning. Because all of the solutions that you come up with that are going to lead to design inputs and design outputs and ultimately the verification and validation are going to look like uh, uh, tube opening or tube unclogging solutions. This tremendously influences or limits or better biases your, your design. Remember, answers are only as good as the questions that we ask. So to take this a step further, and I don't want to get too far into the biology here, but it's really difficult to talk about medical devices in an intelligent way without looking at the biology as well as the engineering. Uh, what's the biological problem? What's the root cause? There's an adage, if the only tool that you have is a hammer, all of your problems tend to look like what? Nails, right? So the root cause here is not, underlying not, to open up a clogged artery. Rather, the root, the, the root cause, the root of the problem that we're trying to solve is to figure out a way to get oxygen and glucose and other uh, things that are metabolically needed to the cells downstream from this occlusion uh, that can't get there because of the occlusion in the coronary artery. You see, if you, dis if you define your user need and your design input that way, then you'll be able to come up with a whole bunch of other possible solutions that have nothing to do with the coronary arteries, like, for example, transmyocardial revascularization, or TMR, a process where we essentially create new channels in the heart to take the place of the coronary arteries. Uh, that's what I call mechanical angiogenesis, or some of you might be familiar with true angiogenesis, getting the heart to grow new arteries where none existed before. Okay, So again, the reason why I'm trying to illustrate this here is we can validate a stent by showing that it opens up a clogged artery. And by that definition, all stents are effective. But is that the real problem that we're trying to solve? Absolutely not, because when you look at the result, this is a study from just a couple of years ago, and this is one of many. Again, I'm using stents as an example, but there are lots of others. Uh, over, a hundred, oh, sorry, over a half a million patients per year are, uh, have stents put in them to relieve chest pain. costs a lot of money. But in this particular study, they looked at 200 patients. They followed them over six weeks with drugs. They either did a, a stent or they didn't. And uh, this was one of the few cases in cardiology in which a sham procedure was given to, to controls that were then compared to patients receiving the actual treatment. Uh, in both cases, the, the, the patients um, got the same thing, but here's the result. Here's the conclusion. A procedure used to relieve chest pain in hundreds of thousands of patients per year is useless in many of them, is useless in many of them. So my question, I'll leave it as a rhetorical question, but I hope everybody uh, appreciates the significance of this. Is this a sham procedure or, in fact, is a bare metal coronary stent a sham device? I think this is a very interesting example of a failure of a validation in the sense that we are not validating the right problem. We are not validating the right solution. Again, let me be clear. If, you're, if you define your problem to open up a clogged artery, then all of these solutions are effective. On the other hand, if you define your problem to be 
um, uh, to prevent heart attacks and to relieve chest pain and so on and so on. Then the 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 the, the data is not so uh, conclusive on that. And let me give you an even more timely example. I do a lot of work now in the area of COVID. As a matter of fact, about a third of my business is COVID-related medical devices, uh, including ventilators. I've had a number of companies come to me and ask me to help them get emergency use authorizations or uh, EUAs on ventilators. And one of the first questions I like to ask them is, are you solving the right problem? Are you asking the right question? What do I mean by that? Well, very recent evidence, and I'm talking about within the last, say, four weeks or so from some of the big hospitals here in the United States, is showing that about 80% of people that go on a ventilator will eventually die. 80% of them will eventually die, and of those people that don't die, most of them will never come off a ventilator. So a lot of people are talking about, uh, you know, ventilators and how do we get more of them and do we have enough and so on. But is a ventilator a real solution to the COVID problem? Is it even a Band-Aid for the COVID problem? Once again, I'll leave that as a rhetorical question, but it comes right back to the topic of our discussion today. What good is validating a ventilator if a ventilator is not the solution to your problem? Uh, And speaking of uh, COVID and the emergency use authorization, if you're interested, just as an FYI, I did uh, just about uh, six weeks ago uh, a much more detailed webinar on the EAU for Greenlight.guru. If you're interested in this particular topic, I would encourage you to go to Greenlight's website. You can watch the webinar for free on demand. And if you have questions, uh, please come and and contact me, and I'd be happy to, to talk about them. Just to close the loop on that that last example, uh, we should always question the status quo. Here's the cover of Business Week magazine. Admittedly, it's from about a, a 15 years ago, but it's still just as important today, uh, just as relative today. Medical guesswork from heart surgery to prostate care, the medical industry knows little about which treatments really work. Treatments are based largely on rules and traditions, not scientific evidence. This is uh, as much of a validation problem as anything else because, yeah, we're doing a lot of validations, but are we validating the right stuff? So what's the consequences if we do a validation and our validation is wrong? Well, here's just one quick example. Some of you are probably familiar with the Da Vinci surgical robot. It's been in the news a lot in the last few years, especially not always for the, for the better. It turns out that there's a lot of problems with the Da Vinci. It's a terrific uh, tool from a technology perspective. It's got a lot of bells and whistles, which as an engineer, you know, I can get really excited about. But it's also got some real challenges, including on the usability side. And as a result, uh, there are there are a number of problems with this particular device. I don't have time to, to talk about it in detail, but suffice it to say, if we validated this better, would we be having these problems now? Which brings us to the question of usability validations. You know, usability is another topic that I've done a lot of podcasts and webinars on. I see a lot of companies do usability testing, and usability testing is just another form of a validation. But the vast majority of usability studies are not realistic. I'll give a quick example. I did a presentation at a conference. This was prior to COVID when we were still being able to to travel. And coincidentally, the person speaking before me was doing a presentation on usability testing, and she was describing the usability study uh, for a particular surgical device. I think it was a laparoscope. And one of the things that she mentioned is that the the surgeons had to to read and follow the, the directions for use, the DFU. And I said to her after the after the presentation, because I wanted to have a good public debate on this, and I said, well, you realize that you now have totally invalidated your entire usability study because we all know, whether you want to admit it or not, that most people don't read that crap. They take the DFU out of the box and they threw it right in the trash. And she said, yes, Mike, uh, I agree with you 100%, but it passed muster to the FDA. So my point is very simple. What good is doing a validation, whether it's a usability validation or some other form of validation, if it's not realistic? Something to think about. If it's not realistic, isn't it just a a colossal waste of time and money? Again, something to think about. What are the additional consequences uh, if if your validation is wrong? 
Well, many of you are probably familiar with the Bleeding Edge documentary on Netflix uh, about uh, a year and a half, actually about two years ago now. Uh, if you haven't watched it, I highly recommend it. I've characterized it as a mandatory viewing for everybody working in the medical device industry, uh, not because uh, I think it's a particularly good portrayal, a positive portrayal of the medical device industry. It's not, but it does uh, do a good job of uh, pointing out a lot of the problems with some of the most commonly used medical devices. And I think that a lot of those problems go right back to validation, not the fact that uh, we didn't do a validation, but rather we did do a validation, but it turned out to be the wrong validation. And one step beyond the implant files, uh, sorry, beyond um, Bleeding Edge is the implant files, uh, something that I was involved with. Uh, this came out a couple of months after um, the Bleeding Edge uh, that basically concluded that as many as 83,000 people around the world have died in the last decade as a result of faulty medical devices and almost 2 million people uh, um, uh, were, were injured uh, as a result of them. And so, uh, you know, these are all regrettably, many of them, not only are they foreseeable problems, but they're preventable problems. You know, oftentimes companies will call me up when they're, they're having a problem, they're in a hole, and, I'll, and they'll say, can, I, can you help us get out of this hole? And I'll say, sure, I'd be help, happy to help you get out of this hole. But more often than not, I also have to tell them that if you would have called me six months ago or a year ago, we might not be in this hole to begin with. Unfortunately, the vast majority of problems that I see companies run into, and I take no pleasure in saying this about our industry, but I think it's true, the vast majority of problems that I think uh, that I see companies get into, not only are they preventable, they're predictable. Let me say that one more time. Not only are they preventable, they're predictable. Something to think about. So what's the root cause of many, certainly not all of these kinds of problems, but many of them, I would argue, improper validation. Yes, we're doing lots of validations. We're ticking off all of those tick boxes on the regulatory and quality forms. But what good is, uh, is ticking those boxes if we're not ticking the right boxes, if we're not solving the right problems? A couple of other things I wanted to mention quickly before we open this up for Q&A is what else needs to be validated that, the, that most people don't think about? Well, what if your device is reusable? Some of you may be familiar, I hope, with the reprocessing fiasco that happened a couple of years ago where, in a nutshell, uh, several people at UCLA and other places were, uh, were, were died because of contamination um, uh, of uh, colonoscopes that were not uh, reprocessed properly between per, 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 uh sorry, between procedures. By the way, this is not a new problem. Some of us, myself included, were talking about exactly the same problem back in the early to mid-1990s. So anybody that thinks this is a new problem, with all due respect, um, pull your head out because, uh, because these problems have been known for a long time. Well, the reason why I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm bringing it up here is because this is not, uh, as I said, a new problem. This is a foreseeable problem. But the validation, uh, sorry, the reprocessing procedures that were used prior to this particular incident were never validated, and they were certainly not validated by the, um, uh, by, by the people that were doing the reprocessing. As a result of this case, some of you are probably familiar, FDA put out a guidance on reprocessing literally a week or two after the UCLA incident, if you think that's coincidence. So, okay, fine, but <laughs> it's, I don't think it's coincidence. By the way, my friends in Ottawa at Health Canada, they put out a similar guidance about six years before that. So Health Canada was, was well ahead of the curve in this regard. But here's the limitation. The guidance says you have to validate your reprocessing procedure. The guidance doesn't say who has to do the validation. So think about it this way. Most medical device companies don't do the reprocessing themselves. That's done either by the hospital, most frequently, or sometimes by some sort of a reprocessing company. Either way, it's not the medical device company. So here's the problem. If the device company writes a reprocessing procedure, and validates the reprocessing procedure. But the reprocessing itself was, is being done not by the device company, but by somebody else. Does it really take an MD or a PhD or an RAC after somebody's name to appreciate that, gee, maybe there's a problem here? So once again, this is a classic validation problem. In this particular case, it's not the validation itself 
But who's doing the validation? Once again, and I don't mean to be melodramatic, but this is, I think, a very important point. It's not, uh, if, if the medical device company is not doing the reprocessing, why should they be the ones who do the validation of the reprocessing procedure? To me, not just as, as a regulatory consultant, but as a biomedical engineer, to me that makes absolutely no sense. And by the way, this guidance that I just mentioned, uh, it now uh, has been expanded to lots and lots of different kinds of medical devices. So please don't take away this part of our discussion with an understanding that, well, this is only true for uh, duodenoscopes uh, and not for other medical devices. On the contrary, now every single medical device that is designed to be reusable, I don't care if it's 510K, de novo, PMA, or what, every single one needs to have a validated reprocessing procedure as part of the 510K, de novo, or PMA submission. The question is, though, in my opinion, who does the validation? And once again, I'll leave that as a, uh, as a rhetorical question. Uh, for those that are interested, I've put out a lot of information myself on this particular case and, and, and reprocessing. You can check out some of my resources. These are in the handout for today's uh, presentation as well. Uh, and you can go to my LinkedIn site. You'll find lots of similar information as well. Okay, just a couple of other uh, uh, questions to ask before we open this up for discussion. How early in the development process should we start thinking about validation? In my opinion, kind of like regulation, it's never too early to start thinking about validation. But what I mean by this is not validation, let me say, in the engineering sense of the word which is, I'm sure, what most of this audience are thinking of when you, when you think of validation. I'm talking about validation in the philosophical sense of the word, which is just as important, if not more important, than the engineering validation. And what I mean by the philosophical uh, connotation of validation is, are we solving the right problem? Are we asking the right questions? And so on and so on. So start out by validating that we're solving the right problem. That's an important takeaway from this particular presentation today. Start out as early in the medical device development process as you can by asking the question, are we solving the right problem? Are we asking the right question? After all, what good is getting the right answer if we're asking the wrong question? How do we know not just what we validate, but what we don't validate? Validating what we don't do, in my opinion, is just as important, sometimes more important than validating what we do do. Now, I'll give you a perfect example of that. Um, I do a lot of uh, pre-submission meetings or pre-subs at the FDA. When I go to the FDA with a pre-sub, most always one of my uh, meeting objectives is to present my testing matrix to the FDA because I want to avoid a very common scenario where a company does a certain number of tests, they make their submission, and then FDA throws their submission back in their face because they say, well, we would like to see you know, these one or two additional tests. That's a very amateur mistake. It's a very elementary school mistake. It can be easily avoided by taking it to the FDA in advance in the form of a pre-sub. And one of the objectives in that pre-sub is to, it should be, to present your testing matrix. And so in the testing matrix, what I do is I present all of the tests that I've either done or planning to do to show safety and efficacy, to establish substantial equivalence, and so on and so on. But I don't, as most people do, stop there. The vast majority, I would probably say more than 95% of people when they go to the FDA, they only um, explain or validate what they do. They don't say anything about what they're not doing. So not only do I uh, justify the testing that I'm doing, I also justify the testing that I'm not doing and why I'm not doing it. In other words, I want to demonstrate to my friends on the FDA side of the table that I know what the heck I'm doing, that I have considered all my options, and I want to give FDA every opportunity not just to agree with me but also to disagree with me. So, for example, if there's a test that I think that some people might think that would be necessary for my particular device, but for whatever reasons, based on the biology and the engineering, not the regulation, by, by the way, but the biology and the engineering, I think that test is not necessary. Like, for example, a certain kind of a biocompatibility test. And by the way, I'm a subject matter expert for FDA in a few different areas, one of them being biomaterials and biocompatibility. I see a lot of companies doing a lot of biocompatibility testing that, in my opinion, as a professional biomedical engineer is totally unnecessary. 
Why? Because they're just ticking those boxes on the form. And I see FDA asking for a lot of biocomp testing that is totally unnecessary. Why? Because they are just ticking boxes on the form. Now, again, don't miss my message here. I'm not advocating taking shortcuts. I'm not advocating doing, uh, sorry, not doing things when, when we should do them. On the contrary, we many times I'll say to a company that they should do things beyond what is required by the regulation because I don't think what the regulation requires in some cases is enough. What I'm talking about here is making decisions, including validation decisions, based on the biology and on the engineering, not simply on the <coughs> excuse me, simply on the regulation. So to complete this thought. What I'm talking about here is not just justifying the, the, the testing, including the validation the testing that I'm doing, but the testing that I'm not doing and why I'm not doing it. So when, not if, we change our medical device, how and when do we revalidate uh, it? Uh, this gets into the world of change management. And um, I've done uh, uh, actually a, a webinar a couple of years ago on change management for uh, Greenlight. It's on their website. You can take a look at it. It's also in the handout. But just to impress upon you the importance of this topic, the single most common reason why companies get warning letters in 483s is because of change management or the lack thereof. And so how do you know when you need to revalidate re based on a change? Well, I'll just share with you one of many examples. This particular one, the gynecological mesh uh, de uh, um, device from Boston Scientific that led to almost 50,000 uh, uh, lawsuits. And when you expand this out a little bit further, when you look at similar meshes from other devices, uh, we're talking over 80,000 lawsuits. That were, uh, that were generated by this particular type of device. We don't have time to get into the details of it, but suffice it to say, yet again, this is another classic validation problem because in some cases they didn't do a validation of a new material or more importantly, they did a validation that was not appropriate, that did not make sense, and yet it still ticked off those regulatory boxes. So again, if you're interested, take a look at that, uh, that webinar uh, for, for more information. The last thing that I want to mention before we open this up to Q&A is uh, the challenges for the future. One of the biggest limitations of the design controls, in my opinion, is the fundamental tenet that, as I mentioned at the beginning of today's discussion, you want to make sure that you meet the needs of your user. The underlying assumption there is that the user knows what they really need. And let me tell you, in the almost 30 years I've been working in the medical device industry now, I will never make that assumption. I will never assume that what the doctor tells me they need is what, in fact, they really need. That's probably what they think they need, but that's not always what they really need. Uh, and this is the difference between evolutionary versus revolutionary product development, uh, which is the topic of a different discussion. But in a nutshell, most medical device uh, development is evolutionary. We have a device like a catheter or a stent or some other piece of software. We tweak it a little bit. We make it a little longer, a little shorter, a little fatter, a little thinner, and we turn it into a new device. Uh, and I understand all of the advantages of that from a business perspective, from an engineering perspective, but from a regulatory perspective. But here's the problem with that. The horse did not, uh, sorry, the car did not evolve from the horse. The light bulb did not evolve from a candle. You can tweak a horse as many times as you want. You'll never end up with a car. And so what I'm talking about here is revolutionary product development as opposed to evolutionary. When we're brutally honest, when we look at the regulatory system that we have today, it is clearly intended to, to promote evolutionary product development and at the same time not promote, I would even argue, um, uh, uh, inhibit revolutionary product development. It's simply as, as evidenced by the, the number of 510Ks that we have over de novos. That's a, that's a very simple example. So how about one quick example? Can we uh, print a stent, 3D print a stent? And I do a lot of work in this area. Uh, suffice it to say, we can. Here's a very short video on being able to 3D print a stent Imagine being able to do this right in the cath lab moments before the cardiologist puts it into the, the patient. And not just a bare metal coronary stent, which is, which is boring. These things have been around for almost 100 years now. But how about a bioabsorbable stent, a polymeric stent, and how about a stent that has drugs and biologics on it as well? 
all of this is eminently doable, um, but it's taking us a, a, a very long time to get there for a whole bunch of reasons, not the least of which is the regulatory challenges. And uh, although, unlike a lot of other people, I refuse to use regulation as an excuse to hold me back. I refuse to dumb down technology uh, in order to be able to get it through the FDA. I say to companies all the time, you give me the product that will give us the best clinical outcome, that gives us the best solution to the biological and engineering problems you're trying to solve. And don't worry about the FDA. As long as the biology and the engineering make sense, we can sell it to the FDA. But I'm getting tired of seeing a lot of companies dumb down their technology, take features out of their technology, for example, to, uh, to, to, to make it easier to get through the FDA process. And that's just uh, not what regulation is, is intended to do. So back to validation, how do we validate this? Well, the, the short answer is we don't validate the device or, the, or if it has a drug, this would be a combination product. We validate the process. And that's the solution to the, uh, to the clinical trial enigma that personalized medicine poses, whether we're talking about 3D printing for medical devices or pharmacogenomics for drugs, it doesn't matter, is focus on the process as opposed to the product. Again, this is another example of validation, uh, something that uh, I've put out uh, in, in much more detail, validating processes like this in other places. So let me wrap this up because we have just a, a, a couple more minutes for Q&A with a couple of final thoughts. What are we really trying to accomplish? You know, as I mentioned uh, earlier, there's a common adage that I used to say to my med students. The surgery went perfectly, but the patient died anyway. The regulatory spin, we followed the regulation perfectly. We did that, all that FDA asked us to do, and yet the patient died anyway. The engineering spin, we designed the medical device perfectly, but the patient died anyway. Unfortunately, these things... Uh, oh, and finally, the testing or validation spin. We tested or we validated the medical device perfectly, but the patient died anyway. We saw some examples of that today. Unfortunately, these problems happen more frequently than a lot of people would like to think. And the solution, in my opinion, is not to create uh, more regulation because we've already got tons and tons of that, uh, but instead to get people to think. That's uh, not such an easy thing to do. So bottom line, if we meet the regulatory requirements, have we done our job? If we do a validation, is that sufficient? Have we done our job? You know, as I've said in many of my discussions in the past, when, they, when a company gets a 510K clearance, when they get a PMA approval, when they get an ISO certification, when they get a CE mark, that's the academic equivalent of being a C student. That just means that you're passing. It doesn't mean that you're making a, a safe and effective product. It certainly doesn't mean that you're making a good product. I hear a lot of my friends say, you know, our goal is regulatory compliance or quality compliance. Compliance is a pretty low place to set the bar. I think we as professionals, we as companies, we as an industry can do better than that. And finally, you know, when it comes to the takeaway here, doing a validation is not enough. Remember, this is not just simply ticking boxes on a form. If anybody, and I'm, this is going to sound harsh to some people, but anybody that has that mentality that's working in this business of ticking boxes on a form, they should not be working in this business. Pure and simple, because this is not about ticking boxes on a form. If you're not doing the right validation, in other words, if you're not asking the right questions, if you're not solving the right problems, then I hope many, if not all of you, would agree that this is probably just a colossal waste of time and money. Even though it's a regulatory requirement, even though we're ticking those boxes, what good are we really trying to accomplish? So the last thing that I just want to mention, and then, uh, Tom, I'm happy to open this up for some quick Q&A. There's a lot of regulatory consultants out there, but there's very few good ones. If you want to become a good one, you have to not just learn when to follow, but more importantly, learn when to lead, because somebody who wants to lead the orchestra must first turn their back on the crowd. And believe me, this is not a common approach in the uh, medical device industry in general, in regulatory affairs or quality in particular, but it is my approach. So at that point, we just have a couple minutes left for q and A. I'm happy to, to take as many of the questions as we can squeeze in, but I want to thank everybody for their, for their attention. Um, went through a lot of information in a short period of time. I want to thank my friends at Greenlight for the invitation to be part of the conference today. If there's anything that, any, that I can do for anybody in the audience, you have my contact information. Feel free to email me or give me a call. I'll be happy to help wherever I can. Tom, you take it from here. Thank you.
Yeah, thank you very much, Mike. That was extremely informative, very helpful. I think the revolutionary versus evolutionary design really hit home. I remember starting and thinking, wow, we're just tweaking a lot of things, but your challenge to be revolutionary <laughs> was great. Uh, I, I do. So we have a couple minutes, like Mike said, there's a couple there's a list of questions and just to be clear what it, Mike's going to get these questions and we'll follow up with some of the answers. I will pick a couple of questions here. I get, I'm getting a lot of great comments, by the way, Mike, this, this was awesome. Thanks a lot. So thanks Thank for you. that. Thank um, you. One repetitive question that kept coming through is, can you just speak higher level to the differences between design validation and process? Are there links between them? Does one encompass, encompass the other any quick thoughts on that yeah it's a great question and in my longer presentation in the other webinar that i did for Greenlight a year or so ago i go into process validation a little bit more but fundamentally validation is validation whether we're talking about this, uh, validating the device or validating the process and by the way for those of you that are fans of the design controls you know that the design controls remind us. I don't like to say it requires us because I would like to think that we would know to do these things anyway. But it reminds us that we need to validate our design, our device. We also have to validate our process that we use to make the device. But the, the design controls do not go so far as to, as to remind us to validate the two together. And in my opinion, that's another weakness of the design controls because as our devices get more and more complicated, even in the 510K universe, to separate the device itself from the process that we use to make it, to me, makes absolutely no sense. And top of the last example that I shared today about the 3D printing, that's a quintessential example of how, you, how can you separate the, the device itself from the process that we use to make it. So one piece of advice that I would give, and it's not a regulatory requirement or a quality requirement, but perhaps it should be, not only should we validate the, 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 the device, as I talked about today, we should validate the process. So in other words, are we using the right processes to make the device? But then we should put the two together because there are a growing number of examples. I don't think we have time to talk about them today, Tom, but there are a growing number of examples where the, the, when we validate the device itself, that's fine. When we validate the process to make it, that's fine. But when we put the two together, it's not fine anymore. And so why should we wait until there's a problem with the device already uh, when it's on the market? That should be part of the, 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 the pre-market discussion as well. I don't know, Thomas, that does a good job of answering that question, but maybe there's some others that we can get to. That, that is a good one. Here's, here's another one that's probably, again, a little philosophical, but I think it's a great one. You talk about like what the regulatory requirements have kind of forced us down this process. How do you, do you have any quick tips to convince your upper management that design validation needs a lot more attention? <laughs> uh, well, I would like to think that that wouldn't be necessary, Tom. I would like to think that all of us, you know, understand that we're not making, you know, little widgets here. We're making, you know, medical devices that in some cases go inside of people's body. And in some cases, you know, let's look at the class three universe. Uh, you know, if the patient, you know, if the device works, the patient lives. If they don't, they die. So I would like to think that we wouldn't have to do those things. But I also, Tom, didn't fall off the turnip truck yesterday. So here's my best <laughs> advice for those of for, for those in the audience that know me, you know that a, a, a growing part of my business is actually working as an uh, uh, expert witness in medical device product liability cases. And so what I try to do with my medical device customers is focus on the carrot. You know, hey, these are the things that we really should be doing. Some of them are required by the FDA. Some of them may not be required by the FDA. But for those that are not required, we think we should do them anyway because it makes sense by, you know, from, from a biology and engineering perspective. If that's not enough, Tom, to get them to bite on the carrot, then I might gently hit them with the stick. And I might say, look, if there's a problem with our medical device in the future, you know, a lot of people say to me, Tom, they fear the FDA. I say, no, 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 no. You shouldn't fear the FDA. You should have a healthy respect for the FDA, but you shouldn't fear. Who should you fear? You should fear the product liability attorneys because the product liability attorneys can instill a heck of a lot more damage to a company than the, than the FDA ever could. And putting myself in the, in the uh, expert witness chair, I've been in that chair now many times. If I see that a company did not do a proper or an appropriate validation, I'm not talking about a validation that ticks the regulatory uh, boxes but a proper or an appropriate one like we've been talking about today, it doesn't take much 
much, you know, to, to get that jury to hear a ka-ching, 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 right? So mm-hmm. I would like to think that we could, you know, encourage the, our senior management, you know, to do the right thing because it is the right thing. But if necessary, you know, maybe, I don't want to say threaten them, but just remind them that, hey, if we don't do what we should do, you know, we might be looking at potential product liability consequences in the future, never mind mm-hmm. FDA consequences. Does that make sense, Tom? It makes total sense, I think. I think it's great advice, and uh, I wish we could keep going. This is very interesting. I know we've got the next presentation coming up here in a few minutes. So um, as mentioned, this list of questions, we'll, we'll take a look at and follow up. And um, and Mike, thanks so much. This uh, re- really appreciate it. Thank you, Tom. And thank you to the audience you, as well. Thank you, audience. Yep. Hope you all have a good day, and, and we'll talk to you at one of the next presentations. Bye.